Well, good afternoon, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you so much for attending our, our seminar on ESG investing in the future of capital markets in Asia and the Pacific. This is a really exciting new area for us and for ESG investing through the capital markets, and I'm very pleased today to be here with our distinguished guest uh, from the Bank for International Settlements, the Japan Exchange Group, the National Bank of Georgia, the Securities Exchange Commission of the Philippines, the Indonesia Financial Services Authority, and Carbon Wise from Thailand. My name is Christine Engstrom, and I'm head of the finance sector, and I'm going to be your moderator today. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ramesh Subramaniam, who will deliver our opening remarks. Ramesh has been with ADB for over 25 years. He is currently our Director General and Chief of the Sectors Group of seven sectors, including finance. He's led various landmark bank-wide initiatives, including, including the ASEAN Policy Network, the Green Finance Hub, and then significantly contributing to the region's response during COVID. Please join me in welcoming Ramesh. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. So nice to see a room full of people after lunch. Uh, my job is super simple, uh, just to introduce the topic and then leave it uh, in the efficient hands of the wonderful panel that we have. Um, clearly, mobilizing uh, resources, mobilizing finance, I see our treasurer, Pierre, uh, mobilizing money is so important, obviously, in the, um, in the development space and particularly countries, developing member countries that we work with, uh, always ask for innovative solutions in finance. Uh, actually, they ask for innovative solutions in anything and everything that we do, and particularly in the finance space, that call, that demand has, uh, has been growing in momentum. So in that context, we are delighted to have this seminar entitled Digital Bonds for ESG Investing and the Future of Our Capital Markets. The um, Asia and the Pacific region has been, the, land, the finance landscape or the financing landscape rather has been changing. Um, we've gone through the uh, various crises, but uh, still the region has been very, very resilient. Going back to the late 90s Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, but the region has become very uh, resilient. Um, and because of that, because of the advances made, and particularly in recent years, uh, ASEAN, one part of uh, Asia and the Pacific, has been a pioneer in adopting its own green taxonomy norms. The region is uniquely positioned to advance sustainable finance. And ADB, uh, from, our point, uh, from our part, we are totally committed to playing a critical role in this uh, transition as well as transformation. Uh, aligned with the Paris Agreement's objectives, uh, ADB has not only set um, very ambitious targets of uh, cumulative um, commitment volume of $100 billion for climate financing alone to be achieved by 2030, but we are also trying to pioneer initiatives to promote uh, various innovative solutions, including digital solutions in ESG investing. Uh, these efforts are very, very important as we leverage uh, financing mechanisms, financing and through various innovative financing mechanisms and tools, such as digital ESG bonds to support sustainable development and net zero transition uh, in the region. This seminar, as Christine just mentioned, brings together uh, financial policy makers, capital market regulators, and uh, market players, market innovators, to explore the potential of digital ESG bonds. This morning, we had a, a fantastic chat with Yoshida San, the global chief executive officer of JPX, whom you will hear from later, in terms of the advances that are taking place and what is the role that uh, advanced markets, advanced countries and institutions like Japan and the others play, and uh, we will also hear from uh, BIS uh, as well as from uh, others, including particularly the regulators uh, from the uh, region. Digital green bonds offer a path for um, ensuring that investments genuinely contribute, genuinely that needs to be underlined, genuinely contribute um, for greening economies. 
Uh, now, leveraging cutting-edge technologies such as the Internet of Things and blockchain mechanisms, we can achieve real-time tracking of green indicators, including greenhouse gas emission reductions, uh, thereby ensuring transparency and accountability in green financing, which is something investors always look for. The BIS, the Bank for International Settlements Innovation Hub, will share their experience uh, with their two projects, Project Genesis 1.0, and Project Genesis 2.0, and how they leverage blockchain, smart contracts, and Internet of Things technologies for tokenizing green bonds and carbon uh, credits. Our second highlight presentation, or spotlight presentation rather, will be from uh, the CEO of the Japan Exchange Group, with whom we are delighted. One year ago, we signed an MOU with them in our Incheon uh, annual meeting. And we have uh, progressed significantly in uh, implementing that MOU. We will hear from uh, Yoshida-san uh, on their pioneering work with automatic data collection and visualization, which can help issuers address certain issues uh, with while um, semi-real-time um, monitoring of green investment impacts, which will also address concerns of investors, uh, such as greenwashing, uh, which we've been hearing a lot, um, as well as collecting, integrating, and utilizing the data. Uh, so our panel will delve into the scalability and traceability of uh, green bonds. Um, and in, in, in this context, we will hear also what are the issues and challenges that regulators face as well, because private sector always uh, moves faster, but regulators need to catch up, and, and what, how is that evolving? It'll be very, very useful. So we look forward to um, actively engaging with all of you, and, and to hear from you during the Q&A, which Christine will be moderating, and learn from this. This is only the, um, I guess we are still in the early stages. About five years ago, we started uh, partnerships with the various institutions that were in their early stages for tracking green investments, and we are delighted that we moved quite far in the, in the last uh, five years or so. So with that, let me pause and give it back to Christine. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Ramesh. I have to adjust the, the height of the, of the microphones. Um, so as, as Ramesh was saying, we have two sections of this panel. The first section is with the two special presenters for their spotlight sessions. Then we'll have some Q&A from the audience. Then we'll move on to our panel and also have Q&A at this time. So let's move to our first presentation. I'd like to introduce Ms. Benedict Nolans. If she could please join us on the stage. Ms. Benedict is currently serves as the head of the BIS and Innovations Hub, as, as Ramesh was saying. She has a background in law and business. She's held several positions at SC Ventures Circle the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, and major financial institutions such as Credit Suisse and Goldman Sachs. Notably, she has been recognized for her leadership in entrepreneurship and innovation, receiving the China Daily Asian Women's Leadership Award in 2016. Ms. Benedict, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me try uh, this clicker first. Okay, that works. So um, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here in Tbilisi. I, I've had um, a few wonderful days already looking at the city and the surroundings. So today I will be presenting to you some of the innovation projects that we've been doing in the BIS uh, Innovation Hub in the context of green finance specifically. So maybe I give some more context to the BIS. The BIS is Bank for International Settlements, and it is a membership-based uh, institution, so an international organization uh, of 63 of the world's leading uh, central banks. So a lot of the central banks of, of Asia, but of course also of, of Europe and, and the US. Um, and so the BIS serves as a place, uh, as a convener to make policy decisions. But uh, recently, in the last four years, we also added the Innovation Hub. And the intention of the Innovation Hub is to, is to explore technology uh, from the perspective of central banking. So 
in this context, we did these two uh, prototypes that, uh, that were Genesis 1 and, and Genesis 2. We started off with this uh, report that you see there, which we called the visionary report, uh, and which pulls together the, um, the viewpoints from quite a lot of parties across uh, NGOs, stock exchanges, um, and also uh, the public sector, including indeed Securities Commission, Central Bank, and ourselves. Uh, from the perspective really of, of Asia, but um, you could say, of course, with, with some involvement also from, from Hong Kong. What we were trying to do is explore how we could innovate uh, the financing. So uh, the first uh, prototype that we did was, was focused on, on thinking around government bonds, green bonds, to be placed to retail investors. Uh, and we viewed that the benefit of tokenization would be really twofold. The first benefit is that it can fractionalize, meaning that if you are an individual investor, as retail investors are, the uh, denomination of the bond can go to a much lower figure than it is today in Hong Kong. Um, the second benefit was that uh, we thought we could reduce the risk of greenwashing by attaching, um, by attaching this to IoT solutions and blockchain. But I'll come back to those as I described the Gen Genesis 2 solution. So, okay, so just to, to maybe continue for, for a bit more on, on Genesis, uh, sorry, I did something wrong. On, on Genesis 1. So um, the, in, in Hong Kong, the bond process for government bonds, first of all, they're very desired by retail investors. So retail investors heavily buy these bonds. They're always oversubscribed. The reason for it is because the Hong Kong government does give a slightly higher interest than it gives, uh, than, than let's say you can get in the bank. So they're desired. So they tend to be sold out quite uh, quickly. But the problem with the current process is that the process is under automated. So it involves three intermediaries, which are the three leading banks, which is Standard Chartered, HSBC, and the Bank of China. Um, and, and the process um, involves also retail investors trying to double subscribe for these bonds to get this higher interest. Uh, and in addition to that, the minimum denomination is 1,200 uh, US dollars, which is quite high. So I said by reinventing that process and thinking around how you can do that in tokenized form and integrating that with the main wallet that we have in Hong Kong, which is the Octopus Wallet, uh, you could avoid a lot of the inefficient processes uh, and increase the engagement of retail investors by allowing them a, a smaller subscription amount uh, and by providing them transparency on the use of proceeds. That was Genesis uh, 1. I would note the Hong Kong government has not yet done a placement to retail, but it has done two placements uh, to institutional. So um, that leads me then to explain to you what Genesis 2 was. So Genesis 2 was together with the United Nations. Uh, and what the concept was is, is looking into this north-south divide and the fact that the south uh, has a hard time to, to get access really to finance for these projects that can lead to better climate uh, outcomes. So the idea was uh, if we again digitize the whole process, we digitize the placement of the bond, we attach to the bond future carbon credits. So carbon credits that are being generated from the use of proceeds of the bond. So let's say you do a bond placement 100 million, it is invested in renewable assets, whether it's solar solar or wind. Solar or wind generates uh, carbon credits. These carbon credits would be auto-delivered. So, uh, so as you can see, uh, the bond, investment, uh, bond investor gives his principal, of course, he gets the bond and he gets these mitigation outcome interests, which are de facto carbon forwards. And these carbon forwards will vest automatically uh, and be delivered automatically. So people can ask and, and they will ask you, why would you automate this whole process, right? Why can't it be done the way it's always been done? And the truth is it can be done the way it's always been done. So I find it hard to say, well, you have to digitize. But what I can say is what the benefits of digitization would be. The benefits in this case is that um, you can asset the, the bond proceeds 
can be automatically tracked, this, this generation of these carbon credits, and they can be real-time delivered into the wallet of the investor. So then the investor can choose whether he has a, a custodian for that wallet or whether, uh, on the other hand, he's self-custodying his assets. So this also addresses the uh, greenwashing issue because you were talking just earlier about the risk of, of greenwashing. If everything is automatically tracked, uh, and in real time, to, to, for example, the, the, the generation of, of renewable energy is real time tracked and these carbon credits are automatically delivered, then you should have much less concerns around uh, greenwashing. The problem with greenwashing today is that there are, for example, audits that are being organized, but these audits are done by humans and the humans only show up at certain intervals. So. That is um, difficult to create an outcome without um, greenwashing. So in sum, we did uh, two prototypes there, uh, as we did with the first. Here you see uh, some of the benefits for uh, the bond holders, the investors, uh, and the bond issuers, uh, and for the ecosystem really uh, at large. Uh, we focus this prototype on, on an institutional context, and the reason is because only institutions uh, we think could bear the risk or price the risk of these carbon forwards. So again, all of this information is publicly available. We have uh, published it, uh, and we have this suite of uh, four reports. Um, we use the lotus, by the way, as a symbolism here because the lotus is very much a flower of Asia, right? But secondly, also because it can actually thrive in muddy waters, unlike many flowers, it thrives in muddy waters. So. Building on this project, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority on behalf of the Hong Kong government has do, done two placements already. Uh, and, and I think now stands as a result as one of the leading issuers of digitized or tokenized uh, bonds. So they did one a year ago with, uh, at the time Goldman Sachs was placing the bond and they did a second bond this year with HSBC placing it. In both cases, they were placed in tokenized form. In the first case with uh, the system of Goldman which is called, I, I forgot, but GDAP, I think. Uh, and, then the, and then the system of HSBC, which I think is called Orion. Um, but these two bonds are not yet having the automated tracking, the IoT-based tracking. So that may, uh, that may be a future, um, a future thing that the HKMA will explore. Now, the HKMA also issued a report to set out the benefits, but also the drawbacks of doing this in digitized form. So I suggest for anybody who's interested in, a, in a, an objective account to, to have a quick uh, look at this. So in some, uh, obviously, the custody is always a question, right? Because um, in the digital asset sector, people have been saying the, the benefit is that you can uh, you can self-custody, but a lot of people don't want to self-custody. <laughs> so in some, the option was given here to self-custody, but the option was also given to still have a custodian. Um, other than that, some risks are being raised, of course. The more you automate, the more you're dealing with cyber risk and the more you're dealing with um, the risk of, of outages, uh, and therefore the more you need BCP planning. So. Um, I think I'm just right on time because uh, she just showed the 30 seconds. And uh, in some, again, you can find all of this here. And uh, I look forward to listening to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Benedict, for that interesting presentation. Our next presenter is Mr. Masanori Yoshida. Executive Officer of the Global Chief of JPX. Mr. Yoshida started his career at the Japanese Ministry of Finance in 1984. He worked at ADB in 1992 to 1994 in the World Bank from 2000 to 2003. And then in the IMF as Mission Chief of European Department in 2011 to 14. And then served as Executive Director for Japan at the World Bank from 2018 to 21. He joined JPX in April 2022, and we're most delighted to have him here to talk about some of their pioneering work in this new area. Please welcome Mr. Yoshida. Um, thank you, Christine, and 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, since time is limited, I'm just going to quickly go over the presentation that I have to do. Um, I'll see. So, uh, first of all, I would like to talk about what JPX is. Um, JPX, as a matter of fact, it's um, Tokyo Stock Exchange and Osaka Exchange merged in 2013. And now it's a big comprehensive exchange group with the commodity exchange as part of a group and also uh, clearing functions and several self-regulatory functions as well. And uh, in the significant thing is that in year 2022, 20, uh, we established the JPXI, uh, that's the JPX market innovation and the research. And we created for the purpose of doing data business IT solutions and the digitalization. And uh, Today, I'm going to touch on this um, digital trackable uh, green bond. And the reason why we embarked on this new agenda is that, well, as a matter of fact, this is a competition among global exchanges and also other market platforms. And thanks to the digital technology, um, DLT, and uh, now the entities can do fundraising without central marketplace. And the investors can identify the best investment opportunities that match their needs. So uh, this is where it started. And um, matching process doesn't necessarily have to take place at the big central exchange. We invest a lot of money to, to just, just to keep our facility and the system. And uh, there's enormous amount of resources dispensed for that. And some of the uh, fundraisers don't need to, to go through that process. Uh, but in order to tap that chance, um, we embarked on this new instrument. So um, this is a trend uh, shows that the historical record of green bond issues in Japan. And you can see the green and sustainability related bond issues here has been rapidly increasing. And now the biggest challenge is how to channel financial resources most recently effectively into the targeted investments that is agreeable both to issues and investors. And one of the most depressing issues is to capture and monitor uh, the green impact. So both issues and investors need a tool to, to, to make it possible in the most effective way. And this is the, the uh, status of, of the uh, green bonds uh, in Japan. I just can skip that. And the key features of this digital track at green bond, as uh, so it's first, it's the green, and that's how uh, it's security tokenized and also uh, it was trackable. And I'm just going to turn to that, to tracking. In general, uh, green projects last for several years. And at the beginning of the project, the tracking issue can be relatively less significant uh, because a green project should come with a good green impact projection, otherwise that project wouldn't sell. However, as the time passes without proper monitoring, investors would be left in the dark Nobody can make sure the performance of that project. But with proper monitoring, we can even identify and fix it quickly if something goes wrong. So um, how does it work? So uh, this is the outline of the first issue uh, that we did uh, jointly with the uh, Daiichi Life Insurance Company. Uh, Mr. Solano is here today representing the institution. Uh, the first, uh, the JPX issues at the bonds, and the second, investors invest in bonds via Nomura Securities. And third, uh, the Nomura uh, TB is entrusted with the management of the fund. That's the upper panel. And now the both the investment broker and the trustee holds a token to, to engage in the tokenized information sharing scheme in a form of blockchain. And if you take a look at the lower part of the chart, the first, uh, the green impact data our environmental metrics data is recorded automatically and electronically on a daily basis. And second, the collected data is securely stored in the green bond token. The third, the data is visualized on a web browser and called Green Tracking Hub that we created, and that is ready for download. Um, with this fund raised by the bond, the JPEG constructed green power generation uh, generators in 2022 in an effort to achieve net zero uh, by the end of fiscal year 2024. Now, I, um, there, there are, of course, challenges. Uh, there are various challenges in tracking and monitoring information. The first, issuers have difficulties in collecting and compiling data themselves, and especially those issuers who have multiple rounds of bond issues 
face multiple complexity in tracking and monitoring. Now, the investors have difficulties faced with the lack of data collection and processing ability and attainability of uniformly compiled data sets. Now, uh, this is the dream tracking hub that we created. And uh, these screenshots uh, shows that on the left-hand side, you can see the data of amount of power generation and the location of power plants and uh, pie chart showing uh, how much funds were allocated to, to individual power stations. And we have one biomass station and two uh, solar power stations. And on the right-hand side of the chart, the bar graph shows the amount of CO2 reduction, and the data can be downloaded as a CSV file, which greatly reduces the investor's workload to collect and evaluate the green, green impact. So uh, these are the advantage of our mechanism. Now, issuers can enjoy automatic data collection and multiple projects in a visually presentable form. This would lessen the workload collecting and integrating and presenting data. And the investors can track and monitor green impacts in one easy access package and evading greenwashing at the same time. This would enable investors to visualize and better understand the data and not counting on issues, behavior, and habits of data disclosure and storage. Uh, our colleague from uh, BIS just stated, but uh, I'll just again highlight some of the advantage of security token. The first nature of blockchain makes it possible to maintain integrity of data, uh, fending off manipulations. Second, uh, easy data linkage enables complex design of projects such as sustainability linked bonds, and transition bonds, where timely identified metrics will be reflected on the coupons or pricing uh, of instruments. So just to wrap up this, this part of the presentation, um, we, we talked about this framework and the scheme can provide a major pathway in addressing some of the challenges associated with the green and ESG related instruments. And these are just advertisements that uh, our project was awarded. Um, also, uh, looking into the future uh, to see the challenges and what the possibility of new applications, um, in order to, to better understand the nature of the digital technology, we established a uh, study panel um, comprised of representatives from industry and the ESG rating agencies. And uh, you can find uh, the details of information on, on our website as well. Um, and uh, during the panel discussions, there are a couple of um, points made for, for potential new applications. And from the uh, issues perspective, uh, there are a couple of project ideas on the left hand side. Uh, this is some, the one of which is energy saving building uh, renovations, maybe a part of it, and that can be incorporated in REIT uh, issuance, a REIT instrument. And second thing is monitoring the fuel efficient transportation equipment and also sustainable aviation fuel. And the green equity issues can, can utilize the technology that we have. And for the data use, uh, issues um, can collaborate with the uh, ESG rating agencies and they can report uh, to government and official authorities. And also um, translating the contents into uh, disclosable materials. And that's at ease of the disclosure requirements is pretty heavy recently, so it's ease uh, that burden on a part of issues. And also they can identify the potential investors who are interested in a new instrument. From the investors' perspective, um, there are a couple of project ideas. Uh, one is that they can use it for community purposes um, and also for the loss reduction. And technology can be utilized monitoring transition bonds, sustainability linked bonds, and green bonds. And as for the data usage, uh, they can use it for impact monitoring. Um, and that can be used uh, to, to standardize the data and, and uh, making the industry benchmark and uh, making benchmarking um, easy. So uh, the hurdles to overcome, probably I can touch on during the panel discussions. Um, the first thing is that um, now it is done on the FOB basis, uh, the settlement is FOB basis, and maybe, uh, maybe we should do to uh, 
convert that into delivery and payment uh, mechanism so as to alleviate the settlement risks. And also the second problem is that uh, market is very thin. And they know to have a liquid market, we, have to, we need to have a secondary market. And uh, lastly, insurance costs will be pretty expensive. So in order to bring it down, I think uh, the scale merit would work. So um, expanding this instrument and expanding the market uh, may suit the purpose. And this is their experience and just summarize what I said. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yoshida Sean. We really appreciate that interesting presentation. We're going to pause here now before we move on to our next session. We have a few minutes to take some questions. Um, we are using pigeonhole, um, or we can do it the old fashioned way, and, and people can raise their hands and ask questions of Benedict and Yoshida Sean as well. Um, in terms of pigeonhole, it's www.pigeonhole. Um, and I'll wait to see if there's any questions coming in. And I do have one question already. Um, that is a question to Ms. Benedict. What technical features and institutional support would be needed for the Hong Kong Monetary Authority to include retail investors in the next Genesis One project offering? Thank you. I think in terms of uh, the technical side of things, um, I think we've gotten it in that sense figured out already because uh, it can be done in, by quite some of the uh, providers of, of tokenization uh, solutions. Um, I think uh, the, the question is uh, for, for governments or, or central banks, they, they are always a little bit conservative about placement to retail and about changing systems. So I think uh, the, the question is how could they go about it in, in a safe way? And in my view, they, they can do that quite easily by, for example, doing a placement whereby maybe part of it is, is the traditional method. Uh, and the other part is is the uh, the new method. So it could be distribution that has both methods. So if you are a retail investor who wants to subscribe in the old way, you can do so. If you are a retail investor who wants to uh, subscribe in the new way, then you can do so as well. Uh, and another way to, to risk manage it is to, for example, have in an initial issuance, have the subscription limited to uh, maybe members of, of the government, central bank, securities commission, et cetera. So I think it's, it's all uh, feasible, but it's a matter of, of taking the jump. Great, thank you so much. We have a question for Yoshida-san. Has any country besides Japan adopted DTGBs into their financial systems? If not, what options do non-adopting countries have to pursue DTGB options? Um, other cases, uh, it depends on the design. I, I think one of the, uh, the, the issues in Hong Kong would be uh, one of those. And we have our own model. Um, so uh, you, you cannot uh, say that the universal, this is the first uh, case that we uh, endeavored on. Uh, but I, in order to expand the market, the scope of the instruments in the market, uh, there are two separate things. One is the, the instrument itself, that is crypt, crypto. And another thing is a monitoring uh, and a tracking point. And uh, tracking and uh, monitoring and tracking part can be built into that module that I just uh, you know, presented. Um, even for the traditional bond issues, you can attach that element into that. Maybe it may not be possible to monitor on a daily basis, but to still you can capture uh, the uh, greenhouse emission and the power generation or other uh, key indicators. And uh, investors can, can see, clearly see and monitor and follow the trends and uh, you can uh, evaluate the impacts. For the crypto thing, in order for that to happen in the real world, uh, Japanese government defined this uh, digitally transferable uh, tokenized securities. And that's part, part, part of the law and uh, you can follow that. But the, the real problem in the daily transaction in order to create the secondary market is that the transfer of ownership. And in the blockchain, uh, the chain participants can understand and know who are the holders and what, what the rights are built into that. 
but for, for the outsiders, it's not visible. So in order to make that to happen, either the regulator or the custodian or the issuer or somebody has to be part of the blockchain. And then we're going to lose this, the, the beauty of anonymity. And uh, if the investor is happy with that, uh, there is a certain way that we can move forward in, in legal terms. Because you have to identify the transfer of ownership and exactly when that took place. And it has to be registered and, and, uh, and the central register. Uh, so uh, in order to create that entity, that entity also needs to have a right to be part of the chain. And that, that's a difficulty involved in that. And somehow we have to find the breakthrough that, and that can boost uh, the opportunity to, to, to for the issues. Great, thank you so much. One last question I'm gonna take, and that's to either Mr. Yoshida or to Benedict. That is, are existing operating assets, so for instance, wind or hydropower plants, eligible for participating in credit, carbon credit accumulation, or is this for new incentivizing, uh, incentivizing new investments? Whomever would like to answer. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this is the perennial question, right, of additionality. So um, I think, uh, of course, it, it may need to meet those additionality criteria. Yeah, for the additionality, um, first of all, we need, we need to have the common grounds that what are what, uh, the additional element attached to that. And we need to have certain consensus. And uh, we need to have access of information that, that actually proves that additionality there. And it may be a difficult part. But uh, I think that's where the public institutions can step in because you can create this uh, database, uh, not that just the market participants could possibly do. Uh, so providing all the public entities as well and making this a big, you know, one big project for everybody to, to, to pay take body. Maybe, maybe to add as well is that this concept, uh, when, when we did it, we focused on the easier to track thing, right? Which is, uh, which is so solar or, or uh, for example, wind. But you can apply the same, the same overall approach to other types of uh, assets, for example, to, to forest, right? And then the monitoring may need to be done with different technologies. So it may need to be done with uh, satellite uh, technologies and, and combined with, with AI, maybe. So in some, the, the broader concept of automation can be applied and, and having this, let's say, feedback to investors can be applied to different types of underlying uh, investments. Yeah. No, thank you so much for those interesting responses and for the great presentation. So please join me in thanking uh, Benedict and Mr. Yoshida. And then let's move on to the next session. We're gonna move on to our round table now. So just because I'm managing time tightly here, uh, let me call up our five panelists. We already have Mr. Yoshida, who I introduced already. We secondly have Ms. Rachel Esther Gumtong Remelante. She is the director of the Securities and Exchange Commission of the Philippines. We have Ms. Novira Indrianengram. She is head of the supervision department of the Indonesian Financial Services Authority, which is OJK. We have Mr. George Laliashvili, head of financial markets of the National Bank of Georgia, and Ms. Natalie Lertesip, CEO of founder of CarbonWise, which is a Thai startup. So please welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much. So we've structured this panel into five different topics. The first is on ESG bond market overview and then measuring impact in Asia. Our first question goes to Novira from Indonesia. Novira, can you please describe the main challenges in measuring impact of ESG bonds in Indonesia, particularly related to data collection and standardized metrics?
Thank you, Christine. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to express high appreciation to ADB for giving me uh, the opportunity to discuss about Indonesian ESG bond market in this uh, important forum. So before I describe the main challenge in measuring the impact of ESG bond in Indonesia, allow me to outline an overview of Indonesia ESG bond market status to give perspective to the topic that we will discuss this afternoon. So in Indonesia capital market, the regulatory framework for green bond has been introduced in 2017 with the enactment of OJK regulations number 60 2017 regarding green bond. After the enactment of this regulation in the following year of 2018, the first green bond was issued by PT Sarana Multi Infrastructure, a state-owned enterprise, with the amount of equivalent to 24.77 million US dollar. This green bond was issued under a technical assistance of the World Bank and uh, was already matured in 2021. And uh, this regulation actually already replaced by a newer uh, regulation uh, issued in 2023 uh, regarding the issue and requirement of debt securities and suku based on sustainability. I will explain more about this new reg regulation later. So in terms of issuance, currently we have six issuers of environmental bond, which consists of green bond and sustainability bond, and one issuer of social bond in our domestic market with total amount or standing of equivalent to 1.47 billion US dollar. If we compare the environmental and social bond with the total of corporate bonds outstanding in Indonesia, which is uh, equivalent to 28.06 billion US dollar, the value of those ES bonds is accounted only 5.2%. Uh, it's uh, a small portion of our domestic bond market. So until March 2024, there are three green bonds issuance with the amount of equivalent to 187.76 million US dollar. So four out of six green bond issuers are banks and non-banks financial institutions so in terms of outstanding value, 92% of green bonds were issued by these four companies. And all of the proceeds were used for green project financing or refinancing their green assets. So if we look at the bondholder information, almost all of the green bonds are held by domestic investor, which is 99.73%. And for for an investor, only 0.27%. Uh, so besides on types of investor, financial institutions hold the majority of green bonds in terms of value. So banks hold 44% and uh, followed by insurance companies hold 22%, mutual fund uh, only 1.8% uh, and then pension funds 9.6%. Uh, so if you look at the transaction data, uh, as we know, the Indonesian bond market liquidity is considered very low. So it's for the green bond and social bonds transactions. For the environmental and social bond, we record there were only 739 times trading frequency in 2022 and 633 times in 2023. For the first quarter of this year, the frequency reached 247. Uh, on the other hand, the corporate bond, uh, bond trading frequency for the same period is totaling 10,500 times. So in terms of value, the environmental and social bond transaction was only uh, equivalent to 366 million US dollar or 7.2 from the total market value of 
equivalent to 4.95 percent billion US dollar. Beside those corporate ES bonds in domestic market, actually there are also government Indonesia ESG bond and Indonesia corporate ESG bond that are listed on global market that we do not discuss uh, at this occasion. So having said that, let us move to the main topic, the question of Christine about challenges concerning the ESG bond impact reporting. So under both OJK regulation, uh, the previous one and the newest one, ESG bond issuer have to submit ESG bonds report annually. So the regulation requires the main content of the report should cover realization of the use of proceeds, achievement from the operational activities or other activities, and its changes, if any, and impact for, from the activities funded. The detailed content, the measurement, and the presentation uh, are varied among issuers. So the situation might not satisfy investor needs in order to get adequate information about their investment ESG bonds. And from the issuer's point of view, in preparing those bond reports, issuer might face difficulties in data gathering, analyzing, and reporting. So the issuer have to provide reliable data and information about their green bond, use of proceeds, and environmental project, and environmental impact. So it would be challenging for them to do so since the data could be very complex. So the instrument used to collect the data could be varied, depend on the project, and might also be different among issuers or project owners. The data and information has to be translated into certain environmental measurement with standardized metrics, such as greenhouse gas reductions or avoidance. So there are also questions about the reliability during analysis and translation process. Do they perform accurately? And do they use proper formula? For example, when a bank issues a green bond, the proceed is used for financing and refinancing its green assets. The banks need to collect data from its borrower, who could be from various industries. So then they analyze and translate those various data into impact and various measurement. So we have reviewed the 2000 issuers green bond report attached within their sustainability report and we find that there is variation in the impact in, pre in presentations uh, within the report. So right now to ensure the reliability of ESG bond report for the interest of investors and issuers, uh, they have to appoint third independent party to review the issuers uh, assertion on their ESG bond report. And we know that uh, this measurement at more cost, like I mentioned earlier, uh, beside the additional cost for the report preparation itself. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Nervir. We appreciate giving some feedback on Indonesia. Let's move to the Philippines. So over to Rachel. Um, can you talk about some of the local, local initiatives improving ESG impact me measurement there? So thank you very much uh, uh, for, that, for that question, Christina. And I'd also like to uh, quickly say thank you as well to ATB for inviting uh, SEC Philippines to be part of this panel. So my answer will not be as comprehensive as uh, what uh, Nervita has shared, but um, in terms of our situation in the Philippines, like, let me just quickly share that in 2019, we had a lot of initiatives in the sustainability, uh, the green, ish, green bonds issue ones and the social bonds. And uh, recently, we also have the sustainability link, sustainability link bonds. So a lot of this initiative started in 2019. Um, mostly I can talk more about um, the sustainability space because we did, so we did issue uh, sustainability reporting guidelines for that one. Uh, that initiative was actually, um, we were quite surprised. It was welcomed. We didn't, re usually when regulators issue some uh, requirements, we, we receive some pushback. But for the sustainability, uh, this was quite welcome because a lot of our publicly listed companies were already uh, started the journey on sustainability. 
And then on the ESG or on the green bonds, uh, I think the Philippines was also uh, among the first in the ASEAN that issued uh, green bonds. Uh, I think now Thailand is leading in the way. Uh, I think the Philippines in the second place. Um, we're also quite uh, happy that uh, a lot of our companies are into uh, greening the market and greening the economy. So in terms of uh, some initiatives, of course, um, uh, recently, uh, because we have observed, because there are a lot of sustainability reporting uh, frameworks out there, there has been some challenges in terms of uh, analyzing the report submitted. Uh, there are some challenges in terms of uh, comparability because of the frameworks used. Uh, we keep hearing the alphabet soup of sustainability, but uh, in so far as the SEC Philippines is concerned, and of course, paraphrasing someone I heard from one, one uh, forum as well, soon we hope to have a clear soup, not an alphabet soup. So what we're looking at uh, at the Philippine uh, regula regulation in terms of sustainability is that we are providing our own template. Uh, we're trying to uh, standardize in our own way what are to be reported by publicly listed companies because we're starting with the listed companies. Hopefully soon we'll introduce this to non-listed uh, large companies. Uh, there is some introduction to the small and medium enterprises, but more focus on the large because of the impact it has on the environment. And um, of course, we, we receive a lot of challenges like uh, when the report were um, when the reports that we received before were um, studied or reviewed, these were done manually. And of course, when it's done manually, uh, human tends to have some um, concerns on, uh, you know, they, they get tired of uh, reading a lot of reports. Uh, it's hard to compare. It's hard to make sure that the information gathered are actually reliable. So I think technology is quite uh, valuable in, in terms of, uh, of uh, improving how these reports are reviewed. Of course, this will also try to avoid greenwashing. Uh, of course, if you have comparison, uh, that, that will also help uh, companies leverage and benchmark among themselves whether how well this similar company is doing in that space. Um, and of course, um, we, we have pro uh, provided uh, our own template and hopefully soon we can be able to, in the Philippines, we'll be able to uh, launch it this year. So on the 2025 reporting and 2024, we can already start the reporting and a comparable way of doing it. So I think those are some of the initiatives we have now at the Philippines. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it. So shifting back to Indonesia, I just want to um, talk a little bit about with Novira, um, some of the approaches and, and how Indonesia is currently positioning its legal and regulatory frameworks to support ESG bonds. Maybe a few comments there, please. Okay, thank you, Christine. So it is wonderful to have Rachel insights uh, on how the Philippines has dealt with the digital bonds, uh, including the regulatory framework and approaches. Talking about Indonesian legal and regulatory framework for ESG bonds, following the Indonesian uh, Sustainable Finance Roadmap. Recently, OJK has published Indonesia Taxonomy for Sustainable Finance last February this year. This new taxonomy, uh, it is uh, a transformation from the previous Indonesia Green Bond Taxonomy that was published in 2022. So as I mentioned earlier, last year, OJK issued OJK regulations number 18, 2023, concerning issuance and requirement for debt securities and suku based on sustainability. This regulation covers broader type of ESG bond that were not included in the previous regulations. Uh, the new regulation provides regulatory framework for the issuance of social bond, sustainability bond, sustainability link bond, and also all those type of bond in the form of Sharia bond. Uh, Islamic bond. For the technology innovation in the primary market, currently OJK and uh, Indonesian Stock Exchange are working together to develop electronic Indonesia public offering platform for bond and suku offering. So previously we had this 
uh, EIPO platform for equity. So we hope when the EIPO platform for bond and suku is ready, uh, we hope that it will support and improve our domestic corporate bond market. It can be also conveyed that at the moment OJK is in the early stage of studying securities tokenization that could fall within Indonesia legal regulatory framework. As a regulator, one of OJK policy is to study the possibility of using technology as enabler in the market development and also supervision areas. One of technologies being evaluated is the, this, the use of DLT or blockchain technology for securities issuance and trading. Based on our stu study in 2022, we found that there are three types of digital assets that could be regulated under Indonesia capital market law. They are securities token, non-fungible token, and stable coin. These digital assets, including the derivatives, could represent real assets, rights of intangible assets, or securities. So in our point of view, DLT is one of technologies that we should get benefit from. So in 2023, based on our new omnibus law in financial sector, there is also a new mandate given to OJK, which is to regulate and supervise technology innovation in the financial sector that accommodate digital assets and digital financial services activities. So taking, talking about Philippines' experience, digitally tracking green bond and uh, project genesis as form of the DLT implementation, we view those as interesting and important models for OJK on how to develop our ESG bond market, although we identify some issues related to these projects. Should we plan to adopt it in Indonesia, such as who will be responsible to provide the LT platform for domestic market, like Boostry in Japan, and some legal issues, including different regulation across different countries, if the bond are uh, also offered to foreign investor. So OJK will carefully studying blockchain technology since the same as other information technology, it is carrying inherent risk. There are several risks associated with blockchain technology such as data security and cyber attack. Thank we you, Novir. Maybe we could just, sorry, just to, I wanted to bring in maybe Georgia a little bit to the conversation. Maybe if you could just kind of yeah. leave us with one thought and then let's move over to Georgia. Okay, yeah. So in uh, in general, we in conclusion that uh, uh, the project that uh, already mentioned in in Japan and also Philippines and, and the project Genesis, a very important milestone that uh, will enhance our knowledge and understanding about the technology and explore its possibility to adopt it for Indonesian market. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. So let's move over to George. So just listening to today's conversation, um, you know, what would be the key issues for Georgia to address first before successfully expanding the market for digital bonds here? Um, and then what would, might be the challenges that would hinder the expansion? Um, thank you and good afternoon. So um, uh, with regards to the di digital bonds, we in Georgia are just taking very first steps so we're not as advanced as uh, uh, Philippines or Indonesia, but we, we won't stay too far, far behind for, for, for sure. But let, let me first mention just a few words about the, the ESG finance, because there we have been uh, quite advanced, especially uh, with regards to creating the uh, regulatory uh, environment and, and framework. So we've done that through dividing the sustainable finance framework, which we published uh, a few years back. So published the, the roadmap, uh, analyzed climate-related uh, risk within the Georgian financial sector, created ESG uh, taxonomy, uh, regulations, rules. So we have integrated ESG considerations in the corporate uh, governance codes for the commercial banks and issuers of public securities. So for, from that perspective, we've done quite quite a lot. So with regards to digital bonds, again, taking very first steps, 
Uh, so we'll focus a lot on learning and education because we think that everyone who is involved needs to understand the benefits, uh, potential use and uh, value added, technologies used and uh, related risks. So we are uh, actively looking right now at digital currency, uh, central bank digital currency and uh, digital bonds. And uh, you may have heard that we have partnered with Ripple who have been sharing their experience and knowledge with our, our team member. So if everything goes well, and we hope so, uh, we plan to issue a first pilot prototype Larry digital bond uh, in cooperation with them and few other actors, local uh, actors in the market. So uh, in general, new financial products or new technologies are meant to improve something it was mentioned called the pain points to remove pain points so to solve problems that could not be solved with existing products or technologies uh, should reduce the cost improve speed raise the efficiency either of those or a combination so this is how we look at digital bonds or green digital bonds in general the the objective is certainly to enhance efficiency transparency and security throughout the bond issuance process so while being a small and developing market, we see this being an advantage because we can introduce innovations, uh, both financial and technological, faster than maybe bigger markets. Uh, so that's why we, we have created regulatory framework which allows for testing promising concepts and the ideas in a sandbox environment, so that's part of our regulation. So we certainly face challenges, but we usually like to turn them into opportunities by capitalizing and learning from, from the other success cases, uh, like we, we heard today, but also experimenting with some innovative ideas to inspire others uh, with our, our own, own success cases. So from a market regulator and infrastructure provider perspective, we think that digital bonds must provide at least the same level of security and investor protection as conventional bonds issued in CSDs in dematerialized form. So uh, it should allow for equivalent KYC and AML protections because uh, the failures in digital bond segment may have negative spillover effects uh, on conventional bonds uh, and this may undermine the uh, investor confidence. So, and this may have reputational as well as financial implications, potentially even financial stability risks. Uh, so therefore, uh, we think that regulations should carefully pursue all the above mentioned uh, objectives, and, but at the same time, they should not be overly restrictive, not to suffocate some good new ideas before they have a chance to materialize in specific products. So striking the right balance is, is the key. Uh, but uh, to be more specific, some of the components we think are must-haves, uh, it was also mentioned uh, earlier um, in the presentation, the settlement should be uh, DVB, so, so there is no uh, settlement risk, which shall probably require use of some type of form of digital currency or central bank digital currency. Uh, so the infrastructure used, so most likely blockchain, must meet high security and uh, resiliency standards. Digitalization should cover entire life cycle of the security uh, and should comply with existing regulations and ensure the integrity of the issue and consumer protection uh, all, all in line with those, those regulations. Great, thank, thank you, you so much, George. Appreciate your insights. I want to turn over to Mr. Yoshida-san uh, again and ask you for some feedback in terms of specific roles that technologies like blockchain and tokenization can play when increasing, to contribute to increasing market size and then attracting a diverse investor base. Uh, simply put, blockchain technology is promising in, in the way that to make investors uh, it's anonymity uh, is there. And this is so much popular among certain part of population of investors. Uh, now coming back to the difficulty that I'm talking about, when we talk about digital assets, if it's the normal asset in a digitally transformable form, um, that's more or less the same as the traditional bonds. Uh, what I'm talking here is that from the perspective of regulations, this is the discussion that, we, that we've been having at the World Federation of Exchanges. Um, the claim is that 
for the uh, alternative uh, trading venues, the regulators must bring in same level of protection, uh, same level as the normal exchanges, like integrity of market, and also uh, this investor's protection. And that's key elements that we have to protect. Uh, but that can be achieved in, in the digitally transferable, transferable uh, securities because this is just this is normal securities that transferable, but uh, this is the speed up of, of, of the um, of the transactions going to be achieved by introducing that. But that's going to place a heavy burden on exchanges because we have to build up our capacity to deal with that. And then also from the regulatory point of view, the regulators and uh, probably the custodian who is going to represent the interior of the market has to be part of the chain. So this is uh, the basic intrinsic difference between the digital transferable assets and the crypto assets. And in terms of crypto assets, um, the basic hin or the major hindrance uh, of, of uh, taking off is the limitation, uh, the supply limitation of the uh, blockchain. Uh, for um, if the proof of work uh, has to be there. Uh, the mining facility, uh, mining activities are obviously limited, so uh, that put the certain constraints on the supply side. And in terms of settlement, that's going to bring in uh, additional level of uncertainty for the settlement. Because uh, in the normal terms, we, uh, we deliver everything in T plus T2, T plus 2, and now we're endeavoring into T plus 1. But in, in the blockchain, until the new supply chain comes in, they cannot sell. So this, this brings in enormous uncertainty in the settlement. So in order to you know, break through all these, uh, maybe some elements of the blockchain technology uh, may be relaxed. So as to bring regulatory authority, might fend off certain group of investor population. So it's this kind of you know, take um, trade off situation. And but the question boils down to which what element investors prefer? They they definitely want to have investor protection or the ease of transactions. Thank you so much for raising those issues and some of the trade-offs to, cons to consider as we move forward. I want to now shift to, to talking about how digitalization can diversify financial products within the ESG sector. So back to you, George, and we'd like to get some of your perspectives um, around this particular issue um, and then how we can talk about the broader fi uh, financial kind of product range will attract more international investors and strengthen market robustness. So over to you, George. Uh, so we already mentioned that, that the digital um, securities need to bring some type of improvement or efficiency gains. So now um, in, in Georgia, we, we already have a modern state-of-the-art trading and settlement infrastructure that uh, offers automations of all the key processes uh, that relate to, to, to the bonds, for example, including issuance, trading, uh, corporate action payments, redemptions. Uh, so, uh, for, for like trading, if it's with T plus zero settlement, trading and settlement can happen automatically in a matter of, of minutes or less. So, with corporate actions like coupon payments are, are fully automated and they can be, the money can be credited uh, to the account of the beneficiary in just again uh, a matter of minutes uh, and then fully automated. So, we need to be really innovative uh, with digital bonds to improve what is already good. Um, another consideration is to avoid uh, market fragmentation, uh, which is uh, critical for a, a market like Georgia, which is just uh, developing. Uh, so it needs to have a, a greater size, more liquidity, like more more participants. So. It, it is important to, to introduce in such situation uh, digital products w without creating market market fragmentation. So, but if we can integrate new technology to existing infrastructure so that it expands and does not necessarily replace what already exists, and this will allow a choice for investors, will bring new investors to the market. 
uh, who were not participating with the traditional bonds or bring new features to existing investors with, with, uh, with these digital bonds. So then the addition of, of digital products will have a positive impact, in our opinion, on the overall market development, entire market. And it can improve liquidity, reduce spreads, and potentially reduce borrowing costs for the issuers. So all of that will, will be great achievements. And with interoperability uh, between digital and then traditional uh, segments, so the, this will benefit to or will bring benefits to to, to all, all entire market. So uh, when it comes to the ESG bonds and specifically uh, or, or uh, ESG linked bonds, uh, obviously uh, digitalization may bring very important improvements. As we all know, ESG bond issuance, planning, issue process, proceeds management and monitoring, so it requires uh, extensive information and data gathering. It takes up time and this is usually costly. So all those steps can certainly be improved with the use of digital bonds. And uh, bonds for which payments are, are linked to environmental uh, outcomes may make dynamically collect data about status of the bond program objectives, uh, provide reports to the issuer or the regulator, the investors or to other interested parties. So there's a lot of potential and so overall uh, I think digitalization will bring a lot of new perspective for the ESG bond market uh, universe. Well, Great, thanks, George. Appreciate those thoughts. Let's shift to Natalie. I think I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in terms of how digital bonds can be integrated with broader environmental initiatives, such as the carbon credit market. And then how does this integration help support environmental projects and advance our sustainability goals? Over to you. Thank you so much, Christine. So just to give a little bit of more of context for myself, I am a climate tech startup founder. I have been working really closely with enterprises and environmental initiatives in Southeast Asia. So carbon credit market is one of the good example for the environmental initiatives, but there are more initiatives such as the, um, the, the plastic credits or the uh, renewable energy certification, so-called RECs. So um, these are the yields that investor will get when they invest in, uh, invested in the, um, the the green projects, and they can sell this this um, these proceeds into the marketplace as well. So um, the investor who invests in these uh, environmental initiatives, they are not only receiving the financial returns, but um, they receive this carbon credits and this is the this is a charms of the of investment in green bonds or in the green loan or um, in the in the green projects and um, the integrations in uh, the integration with the, the digital bonds with the broad, broader uh, environmental initiatives um, it's it brings uh, it shade the highlights for these environmental projects to shine. For example, when we compare, if we were to compare the investment in the in the normal project and the green project, most people would think and compare the the return on investment whether which one is more attractive, and and oft, and in many cases um, the the green project might not be the most attractive when it's come to return on investment. So this carbon credit, just like uh, when uh, Masanori-san mentioned that um, in, when there is a blockchain infrastructure and there is the, if the carbon credit can also distribute it to the, um, to the investor as a byproduct or like an extra benefit for, for investment in the, in the green project, it, it brings in the exciting, uh, exciting elements into investment. So now investing in green projects become more interesting. So for example, when we invest in the um, restoration, uh, forest, for, uh, reforestations, the, 
the extended value is the core benefit it, it, it gives. For example, um, there is the biodiversity, there is the protection of the animal lives and the lower uh, conflagrations rates. So these are the core benefits that enhance and fulfills the sustainability goals. And the integration of digital bonds just shade the highlights for this uh, sustainability goals and invite the investor to learn more and understand more about the the greater spectrums of the uh, impact value and the sustainability goals that uh, the green project is is contributing uh, to to their investment. The the funds that that um, that project is receiving is not only to fund the project but it's also catalyzing the the rollout of the other environmental initiatives to to come as well. Great, thank you so much, Natalie. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was quite stimulating. I, I just like to what I'm saying. I, I forgot to mention the beauty of the trackability on a real-time basis is that uh, in, in, when it comes to the impact financing, if you really look at the environmental impact, bringing in that technology, you can inverse the, the relationship. Now, the most investors want to have monetary returns, and then adjacent to, to that, there's environmental impact. But if you... with, with digital accessibility, you can convert that relationship. Maybe you can trade, say, environmental improvement gain points and the returns is adjacent to it. So uh, you, you can totally change the, your mindset in a way to, to get the more impact in the environment phase. Yeah, no, thanks for adding that comment. I appreciate it. And so now let's shift a little bit more and kind of taking off some of the topics that you're, you're starting to move into um, in terms of how digital bonds can enhance ESG disclosures, which is a really important point that we've all been kind of talking about today. So back to you, Natalie. I'd like to hear some of your, issue, your, your responses in terms of how these digital bonds can really create transparency and accuracy in disclosures, and then what advancements in technology are supporting this? Right, so um, for the ESG disclosure process, it is a very, very tedious and very manual um, process for data collection and putting all the data together in, in, in format, especially in each country or each um, regulations, they have their own framework and format to follow. So it sometimes can confuse the, the, the enterprises on which format to, to follow. But um, with the, with the, so I can see that there, if there is a possibility for the digital bonds to, um, to integrate with the technologies in their local, um, in their local uh, countries to provide the right format and right data to be performed. So at, that will be easy for, for, the, for the companies and for the enterprises to follow and be compliant at the same time. So um, I see two possibilities for, for um, digital bonds to be integrated. First of all, it can integrate with the ESG um, reporting platform that is all, all already available in the market. So this will help the enterprise to, um, to prepare the data and increase the accuracy, reducing human errors and, and prepare the, the right data to be performed. Second integration would be that um, the, the digital bonds can provide the functionalities that allows investors to, to track the impact of the, uh, of the project they are investing invested in, in real terms. So these will provide the transparency for the company, uh, for, for, for the issuers that they will, um, they will be able to take accountability of their, of their impact. And, um, and it will also um, eliminate the doubts regarding the green watching as the companies have to fully take in control and keep up with the, with the data in real time. And um, this is also a room for them to, uh, to monitor and mitigate the reputational risks as well. And um, so at CarbonWise, what we are doing is that um, we develop a platform that help 
the enterprises to monitor and track carbon emissions in real time. We have already working with banks and stock exchanges to, um, to provide the, the platform that allows companies to uh, prepare data in the right format and, and uh, generate the report in the correct framework. So this, um, this, tran this format of transparency helps the, the investor to be, uh, to, be, to be confident about their investment that uh, the data is being, uh, they, they, are, they are able to track the, um, like who is the person who is responsible for the project, who is the verifi verifier of the project, and um, what is the progress of the project so far. They will be able to see those, how much carbon emissions uh, has been generating of the project, and how much carbon emissions has been offsetting this kind of information, the, the investor will be able to see, and it's, it's, it boosts the confidence for them that this project is, work, is performing pretty well. So they, they can rest assured that, um, that the project is, is not greenwashing or, or using it as advertisement. So um, in, in conclusions, I see um, there are, when the, when the bonds, uh, when the, the when digitalization infrastructures of the bonds it create, it opens so many doors for integrations and and most of the two to um, integration that I I think is very important is the is the is the integration that helps companies to figure out a way to to um, to report ESG disclosure in the right formats and for the for the the functionalities that allows investor to be able to track the performance. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Natalie, for sharing your thoughts and some of the interesting work that CarbonWise is doing in Thailand. Um, so back to the Philippines and back to Rachel. So just kind of building on Natalie's points as well as the JPX presentation and, and Vendix presentation as well too, how do you see that these changes can improve investor confidence and market accountability in the Philippines? And then importantly, what are the adjustments that you see need to be made um, to the regulatory framework to bring in and fully utilize the detailed ESG data provided by the digital bonds? So, okay, so I, there's a really a lot to learn from the presentation, of course, from CarbonWise and from GPX. Um, it's important that we get the data uh, real time. Uh, of course, if you look at the regulations, of course, the, the government and the regulators are always accused of being lagging behind. But uh, we'd like to improve on that impression. <laughs> and uh, what, what we can do is, of course, uh, it's important to have some standards. Uh, of course, I, I, I mentioned a while ago about uh, comparability, reliability of information. And it's important that uh, our standards is also interoperable uh, with other frameworks because there's a lot of um, um, global changes, uh, global um, innovations happening uh, in recent times, especially in this space of sustainability. And when you, go, when you look at the ESG bonds, or if it, this is going to be tracked, the regulations should be flexible enough to accommodate um, new technologies uh, that would be able to uh, improve the confidence of any investor. Uh, of course, there's always the fear of greenwashing. Uh, I think uh, Benedict mentioned a while ago about when you have assurers, these are still, people are still involved. Um, man this is still being done manually and errors can be uh, always present in, in that process. But if it's somehow digital, um, I hope it will lessen intervention from uh, human mistakes, and that um, it it can provide more uh, um, it can provide more confidence on the information being given to an investor. Uh, it cannot be avoided, of course, that when 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 investor invests, they look at the bottom line, which is on the profit. Uh, I think um, Natalie mentioned the green uh, the 
sweeten sweetening it with the green or uh, the, there's a carbon credit sometimes it's not still that attractive. I think there must be some push when developing some regulations and awareness. At the end of the day, uh, all, all of us will be impacted if we do not do something about greening the, the market or improving our environment or how we how we are uh, as, as um, citizens of this world to, to be able to, to, to solve the problem. I think, um, yeah, I, I think an impact measurement will always be important. Im impact measurement and assurance uh, that brings in more confidence when, when investing. Um, because if you don't understand what you are investing in, where it's going, how you can track it, is your investment going to the right places? Um, of course, an investor would not be um, assured of pu putting their money in that project. So I think, uh, and of course, stronger corporate governance. Uh, if you have good leaders, uh, good good uh, management, uh, how it's being tracked, how it's being disclosed, uh, that will always uh, go a long way. And that actually increases um, confidence in the in the in the investment i just like to quickly mention uh a while ago some issues on your pigeonhole uh issues on technology uh technology can be sometimes be unreliable but at the end of the day when we use technology this actually eases up uh some regulatory burden or burden on reporters on on how they report and things because of course it lessens the the human intervention if that's reported you can track it you can see it uh, it makes things easier so i think as long as it's not hacked or there's uh, assurance that uh, cyber there's some uh, it, uh, the cyber security uh, issues it's it cyber attacks are avoided that can also be some somehow way of um, uh, improving some of our way of uh, promoting an ESG track, uh, tracking of this ESG uh, bonds. So Great, thank, thank you, you so much, Rachel, appreciate it. We've unfortunately run out of time and I'm hoping that our panelists can stay behind and answer any questions that you have. Um, but please join me in thanking the wonderful panel today um, on this really interesting topic. So thank you to our spotlight speakers. Um, to Benedict, to Yoshida, thank you very much to OJK, um, to Rachel, to George, and then to Natalie as well, too. Thank you very much for attending as well, too.